America, the next presidential election is sneaking up on us. We're at a major crossroads, and whomever we elect will determine if we begin our slow ascent, our rebuilding to become a great nation on the planet once again, or if we descend into destruction and chaos like ancient Rome. The signs are there. History does repeat itself. This podcast is part of our presidential candidate series to help you decide who you want in the Oval Office. My guest today is a renegade in his own party, but all but forced out by the left-wing establishment here recently. His State of the Union address leaned into the dark and bleak times that are upon us now, and yet somehow it went viral. He's rejected both the DNC and RNC and is running as an independent. He, his appeals to conservative voters uh, come in his commitment to take on Big Pharma, seal the border, and his staunch support for Israel. But he also appeals to those on the left with his views on climate change, which are very strong, reducing the size of the military and building a universal health care system from the ground up. When it comes to the First Amendment and climate change, he and I have had our own, let's say, colorful disagreements. Come November, will he be a formidable opponent? Who is he going to do more damage to? Does he have a chance to win it all? Many on the both, uh, both on the left and the right fear uh, his candidacy will ensure either a Trump or Biden victory. But will it? Welcome to a podcast. Uh, we welcome a man whose lineage in politics needs no introduction. He is a candidate for president of the United States. His name, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Before we get to um, RFK, I want to talk to you about Self-defense. And most self-defense situations can be handled with a gun, but that doesn't mean they all should be handled with a gun. I believe wholeheartedly in the Second Amendment, but I also believe in the power of having options. The best alternative is the Berna launcher. I have it. Members of my family and my team have it. My daughter is getting one for her 18th birthday. Surprise, Cheyenne. It is a great complement to firearms. There are situations where less lethal is the way to go. And Burna, B-Y-R-N-A, is the best alternative to deadly force. It fires powerful deterrents like tear gas and kinetic rounds. We're, we're talking things that will incapacitate an attacker for up to 40 minutes. Government agencies, police departments all over the country are replacing their tasers and anything else for their go-to less lethal option. It's Burna. It works for them. It will work for you as well. I want you to go to their website and get 10% off now. You just go to Burna.com slash Glenn. That's B-Y-R-N-A dot com slash Glenn. Robert, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's you good bet. to see you good after see you. many, many years. So um, let me just start with a, a couple of things. First of all, I mean, I don't get to talk to a Kennedy very often. Your father was spectacular. Um, big fan of your father. The speech that he gave when he found out that Martin Luther King had died is the probably the best speech and the bravest speech I've ever seen any politician give. So must be hard to be his son. Well, I, I mean, it's a, it's a source of pride and yeah. comfort for me and my, you know, the first 14 years of my life were spent in his company. And, um, you know, I've, uh, I had the advantage that a lot of people don't have, which is that there are so many books about my family that, yeah. you know, um, most 14 year old kids who lose a dad, um, if they want to find out information about him or, or think about, you know, how do you, how would he have responded to a certain right. situation? They don't have access to that material, but I, I feel very lucky that I did. And, um, you know, because you're always kind of measuring yourself against your dad. And I'm yeah. not saying in a competition, but no, I'm no, saying no. in terms of, you know, role modeling behavior. Um, you know, what would he do? My father, you know, I think of my father as a very moral man, yes. a very brave man. Mm -hmm. 
And so my question is, what would he do in this situation? And a lot of times I have that answer pretty much, pretty certainty on my, uh, on my fingertips. And, you know, that gives me a very good milestone uh, for which to judge my own behavior. You remember when your father was called when your uncle was killed, right? I was, yes. And what did your dad say? Well, the day that my uncle was killed, mm -hmm. the day my uncle was killed, I was picked up early. I was going to the Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. with two of my siblings, uh, or actually one of my siblings, Joe. Oh, we were picked up early from school that day, and as we were leaving school, there were um, there were flags in Washington, D.C. were being lowered to half mass. Wow. And I asked my mom, why are they doing that? And she said, a bad man killed, my, killed Uncle Jack. And when I got home, uh, my father was walking in the yard with, uh, with John McCone, who was the head of the CIA. My uncle had fired Alan Dulles after the Bay of Pigs, after Dulles right. lied to him. He actually wanted my father to run the CIA because they thought the CIA was so out of control and right. he only, you know, he believed only my father could straighten it out. My grandfather had intervened and said, you can't, the optics for the whole world will be terrible if a president's brother is running the secret police mm -hmm. agency. It will be, there's too much, um, uh, temptation right, to, right. to collusion and you know mm -hmm. but, but to politicize it right and so um he they brought in john mccone who was a republican businessman and he was a very pious catholic and they thought that he would straighten it out but of course in the cia nobody ever told him what was going on mm. you know and dulles was still running it at that time from a distance and um, so anyway, my father, the CIA is only about maybe half a mile from my house. Mm. The, the, you know, mm -hmm. we lived in Langley. So we used to, when the CIA was being constructed, the headquarters, we would ride every day, go horseback riding. My father would wake us up at six every morning and take us horseback riding with nine kids. Jeez. And we would go through the CIA property. So I watched it. I'll be billed. And then when McComb was appointed, he would come to our house every day during the springtime and and during the autumn uh, to swim in our swimming pool after work. So he would leave work around four or five and he would come over and do laps and our swimming pool was only a couple of minutes away. A lot of times he'd come to lunch at my house. Hmm. Well, my father was walking with him in the yard and I didn't know what he said at that time, but it's been reported since that my father said, did your people do this? My father made three calls that day. He made the first call he made after J. Edgar Hoover who told him my uncle had been shot. He called the desk officer at the CIA and he said the same question, did your people do this? Then the next call he made was to Harry Ruiz, who was one of the Cuban uh, Bay of Pay. He was a, one of the Cuban activists. He had fought alongside mm -hmm. of, of Castro, then turned against Castro and had been part of the, you know, the the Cubans, the militarized Cubans in this country who were who were part of the Bay of Pigs invasion. He didn't actually go in the Bay of Pigs, but he was part of it. And he was very close to my father and remained loyal to him, even when many of the other Bay of Pigs Cubans had turned against him. And my father called him. He was at a at a hotel in Washington. And my father said to him, again, did it was it your people who did this? He his first suspicion it was the Miami Cubans who were affiliated with the CIA and who were very, very hostile to, to Jack and my, my dad. And uh, because they believe that um, my uncle should have invaded in the Bay of Pigs, should have mm -hmm. provided air support and then gone in and deposed Castro. And they felt he was a traitor, some of them, mm -hmm. felt that he was a traitor for that. And then during, in 62, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they wanted him to go in. And uh, and he had instead 
began a process of detente with Khrushchev and with Castro. In fact, the day that my uncle was killed, he had an emissary meeting with Castro at Castro's summer house at Veradero Beach in, in Cuba outside of Havana and talking about what you know the, the conditions would be to end the embargo to Cuba, which my uncle wanted to do. Wow. And so, but you know, he knew there was tremendous hostility toward him in the Cuban community among some members of the Cuban community and that a lot of those people had been working with the CIA on the assassination programs against Castro and on, and that, you know, a lot of them were highly, highly militarized. They'd been in Batista's army. They were sharpshooters. There was all kinds of, uh, you know, sort of, that highly right. militarized people who were capable of doing this. So I'm watching a show. It's just out on Netflix called The Octopus Murders. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's another really bad period of the CIA starting in the 1980s under Reagan and um, killing and, uh, you know, it's horrible uh, what they were mainly doing. Mainly like Operation Condor and Latin America yeah. and, mm-hmm. the, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, Sandinistas. Yes, but oh. it's much deeper than that, it, it now seems. Um, you know, after, after the 60s, we had the Church Commission. Then the 80s, we're seeing it again with Iran-Contra. We're seeing it now. Is there a way to bring the... CIA, NSA, NSC, all of it under control? Yeah, I mean, you know, my uncle actually, you know, one of the documents that the CIA has been kept secret, you know, and there's a few thousand documents left, but in the most recent release last year, one of the documents that was released was a memo from Arthur Schlesinger to my uncle that uh, summarized my uncle's plans for reorganizing the CIA for how to, you know, end this kind of rogue, you know, operation. Right. And um, and my father, a week before he died, my father was asked by Pete Hamill, who was a famous New York kind of uh, street reporter, you know, um, and very close to my father. He was a high school dropout who become this, you know, incredible uh, reporter, important reporter in New York. And my and Hamill asked my father, they were on a bus in California campaigning, and Hamill asked him, what are you going to do about the CIA? And my father essentially paraphrased what this earlier memo said, mm. which is that we're, he was going to separate the plans division, which is the dirty tricks division, mm-hmm. from the espionage division. They're, they, and those are the two main functions of the CIA. The espionage is what you want the CIA to be doing. That's information mm-hmm. gathering and, and analysis, mm-hmm. analytics. And the president needs that service. He mm-hmm. needs to know what's happening mm-hmm. around the world, what the ramifications of various decisions will be. And um, so that is necessary. And that it, that was why the CIA was founded, Correct. to do that. Mm-hmm. But Alan Dulles, very early on, had changed the function of the the CIA to allow it to do, you know, all these other malevolent tasks, which overthrowing governments, fixing elections, uh, bribing public officials, um, all of the the sort of dirty tricks. That's called the Plans Division. And uh, my father and my father had seen that that tail, the plans division tail, was now wagging the espionage dogs. Mm-hmm. And the espionage division had become the servant to the plans division. And the espionage division's function was to provide um, tasks for the plans division to fit, you know, to fix things right. in other countries. And, that, and then it served the function of justifying those and making sure none of the blowback was ever accounted for or weighed or measured or reported. My father saw that that was catastrophic and that the the espionage division was enabling the plans division to do all this stuff and and making sure they were never held accountable. My father wanted to break them up into two separate agencies. The espionage division would be looking over the dirty tricks division and saying, okay, what was the blowback? What, you know, if you ask the CIA, one of the greatest... 
um, coups in their history. That's not a good word to use because it's right. the actual word. Right. But one of the greatest triumphs in their history was overthrowing Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran in 1953, and then the next one in 1954, they overthrew Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala. Guatemala has never recovered. It's got the highest murder rate in the hemisphere. It's you know got terrible poverty. It, ne it, it never recovered from that. Iran has never recovered from the overthrow right. of Mossadegh. The problems we're having in Iran today, and the you know problems that all go to it. Gaza and Iraq and everything all else, all come from that overthrow. We took the the first democratically elected president in the 4,000 history of Iran and who would love the United States, and he loved us. And Churchill tried to overthrow him first, and his advisors said to him, they threw out the British, British embassy closed, and his advisors said to him, you should throw out the, Amer the United States too, because they are part of it. And he said, no, the United States would never do that. The United States is a colonial nation, and they stand up for democracy, and they believe in us. And that was when Truman was president. And But as soon as Eisenhower came in, and Eisenhower kind of, you know, had this relationship with Dulles, um, mm. where Dulles became very powerful. And, you know, for good reason, Eisenhower had been the general in World War II. He did right. not want to go into another war. And he saw the CIA as kind of a, a a way to manipulate public events and to you know to Avoid get rid war. of problems yeah, yeah, yeah. without sending U.S. troops abroad. Right. And so he relied very very heavily on Dulles. And Dulles, you know, had this. Um, uh, Dulles was able then to just run amok and. There's a terrific, probably the best book on Dulles is by David Talbot. It's called Devil's Chessboard. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. book. But one of the things Talbot says about him is that he was incapable of distinguishing between the corporation, the, the welfare of the corporations that he had represented. Uh, he had been an attorney for uh, Sullivan Cromwell. And which is the biggest white shoe law firm in New York. And his clients had been Texaco. United Fruit Company and you know, these other companies that were operating. Oh, when Texaco wanted the, you know, when when um, when Mohammed Mossadegh said, "Hey, we're going to start actually charging BP and Texaco for the oil that they're taking from our country," um, Dulles said, "Oh, that's con that means they're communists," and overthrew them. But it was protecting the, you know, the financial. Um, uh, find the mercantile interests yes. of Texaco, and right. then the same thing happened in in um, Guatemala. Uh, Jacobo Arbenz had was a democratically one of the greatest leaders in Latin American history, and he said eighty percent of of Guatemala's arable land was controlled by United Fruit, and they weren't using it; they were keeping it fallow. Mm -hmm to keep the price of labor low and the price of bananas high. <laughs> and so Jacob Arben said, no, we're gonna distribute it all to the, to, the, uh, to the peasants and we're going, in, including his own land, he nationalized his own property. And he said, we're gonna pay them for it. But uh, United Fruit had claimed on its tax returns that the that the you know, all of this property, eighty percent of the land in the country, was worth only seventeen million dollars because they wanted to keep their taxes low. Right. But then when he said, "Okay, we're going to nationalize it, and here's your seventeen million," <laughs> they said, "No, no, no, we were making a mistake. It's really three hundred million." And he said, that's not what you've been saying right. for 20 years when you're paying tax and right. we're going to give you what you said it was worth yourself. And so they, you know, got on the phone to um, to Dulles and had him overthrow the government. Wow. And, and Guatemala has never been, so the espionage division ought to be looking at these blowbacks and say, okay, yeah. Obama, you used a drone and you killed the terrorists and, you know, his kids with that drone attack and it was a bad terrorist and we got rid of him. Well, what's the long-term cost? Correct. He has 14 brothers. You know, mm -hmm. are, are they now all mm -hmm. gonna be calm about it or are they now jihadists? Right. You know, and 
that kind of blowback is never, ever assessed by the CIA. And that's one of the problems with, with having those two divisions, um, you know, melded. So with that being said, I, I think everybody has changed. A bit. I know I have changed dramatically since September 11th. Because I've seen the things, you know, when they said they hate us for our freedom. I don't I don't yeah. think so. Um, they hate us because <laughs> we say one thing and then we ghost plane people. Yeah. You know, we are not the nation I thought we are. Can, can we get there? Are we too far gone? Can we get back to our Constitution and Bill of Rights and. And equal justice under the law, being colorblind and all of those things that I always thought we were, but I guess it never really were. I mean, listen, I think if we have a president who understands what America is supposed to look like and is um, is determined to do that, then we can do that, you know. My uncle did that. My uncle changed U.S. foreign policy dramatically. And just in the thousand days he was in the White House, U.S. foreign policy before he came in had one objective, which was anti-communism. And the way that they were executing that objective is putting U.S. foreign policy and, and U.S. military aid to leaders who said, I'm anti-communist, I'm killing communists. But a lot of times they were just they were they were in league with an oligarchy, mm-hmm. and any peasant who complained about you know I'm, I'm not getting enough wages to live that was a, became a communist, <laughs> right. and so the U.S. was on the side of the you know of the oligarchs, and I it was actually we still empowering. Are. Yeah, in fact, you know my uncle had two trips when he was in 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 his three, his three years in office that were the happiest he's ever been. One was when he went to Ireland and, you know, he was the first Irish Catholic president mm-hmm. and it was like a homecoming of, a, right. you know, of, of a, right. a hometown boy who made good. Right. Um, and then the other was to Colombia, And he met the, he, the, uh, the president of Colombia then was a, was a man named Yeris Caramargo and uh, Jackie and Jack said that of all the people they'd met, they and they'd met the greatest leaders in history. They'd met de Gaulle in France. They met Eamon de Valera, who was the George Washington of of, um, of Ireland, who had fought in the Easter Rebellion against the, the British, and he became the president. They loved him, but they said the smartest and the most charming and brilliant of all the statesmen they met was Yeris Camargo in Colombia. I had a million people come out to see my uncle in the main square in Colombia. And yet, Scott Margo turned to him and he said, do you know why they love you? And my uncle said, no, why? And he said, because you, they think you put America on the side of the poor. Mm. And my uncle, you know, made a decision that he was not gonna send troops abroad. He kept us out of allow. He said, his best friend, Ben Bradley said to him, um, what do you want in your gravestone? And my uncle Jack Kennedy said he kept the peace. He said the principal job of a president of the United States was to keep the country out of war. He said he didn't want African children and Latin American children and Asian children when they heard the United States of America to think of a man in a uniform with a gun. Right. He wanted them to think of a Peace Corps volunteer, Mm -hmm. of the Alliance for Progress, which was helping the poor people create a middle class, the the USAID, which that's what it was supposed to do. It's now a CIA. CIA, yeah, front. But that's not why he created it. So, um, But anyway, he succeeded in doing that. He kept the country. He never sent a combat troop abroad. And he, he instead projected economic power abroad rather than military power. And today there's more statues to him in Africa, Latin America, Asia, or universities, more parks named after him, more hospitals than any other president, and probably more than all U.S. presidents combined. Because it was an effective foreign policy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we need to get back to we need to tell the world we're not going to be on the side of the oligarchs and you know the power brokers we're going to be on the side of the poor and of fairness and you know and it's going to be good for our country because we need to build ourselves economically that's the best national right. defense so it's strange we're sitting with two candidates besides you two candidates 
one is always against war. Donald Trump has been against war the whole time uh, and did some really great things in the Middle East, I think. Then we have another <laughs> president that was running for president who I swear to you, I, it's almost to me, it's almost like there's a lot of people that want to go to war. Um, and it all seems to be these Western leaders that I, I don't understand. Ukraine is corrupt. We know that we're we're sending boatloads of money over to them with no checks or balances on it. We know a lot of it is being taken by oligarchs and all the payoffs that go along with it. What 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 is our foreign policy now? And there's no audit. Right. And uh <laughs> And it's the most corrupt country in the world. So, you know, that's, you know, independent assessors say, have said for years, it's the most corrupt country in the world. Correct. By the way, my son went over there and fought. Or, you know, on the side of Ukraine for the foreign legion over there, and he was a machine gunner for a special forces unit. And, you know, he and I don't see eye to eye on the war, um, but, you know, I'm proud of him mm -hmm. for what he did. And I, you know, I, I also have, I share his pride in the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people. And, um, and I don't, I, I, we have a problem mixing people with leadership and exactly. politicians. Yes. Exactly. And that, and you know, this war is an immoral war because it was unnecessary. Uh, Putin tried repeatedly to settle the war, the Minsk Accords, which in mm -hmm. 2019, mm -hmm. It was a negotiated settlement, very fair to Ukraine, very fair to the United States. The U.S., uh, the Britain signed on to it, France signed on to it, Germany signed on to it, and Ukraine. And, and Zelensky ran in, 29, in 2019. He's a comedian and a television actor. He wins with 70% of the vote because he ran on a peace platform, because Ukrainian people wanted peace, peace. and they wanted to sign the Minsk Accords, and, and we could have all walked away from it. And Russia would not have to buzz Lugansk. <clears throat> Instead, Zelensky got in there and he pivoted. Why did he pivot? Well, nobody really knows, but the suspicion is that he was threatened by ultra-nationalists, read sort of neo-Nazis mm -hmm. in his own political party. Mm -hmm. And um, and by the U.S. State Department, by Victoria Newland, who's the head of the neocons, and that she said to him, well, "You will not get U.S. support unless you oppose that agreement." So Putin then goes in, put, and we say we're all told this comic book story. He's a you know supervillain yeah, yeah, yeah. who's going to take over Europe. Really, I don't think so. He said only forty thousand troops. He clearly doesn't want to take control of the country. There's, it's a country of 44 million people. He, and as what he said, he just wanted us back at the negotiating table. So, so we won't help Zelensky negotiate. So Zelensky goes to China, they won't help him. So he goes to Israel and Naftali Bennett, the Prime Minister of Israel said, I'll help. And then he goes to Turkey and Ahmed Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey says, I will help. And they sit down with Putin's people. They negotiate another agreement. And the main thing in both agreements is Putin doesn't want NATO Correct. in Ukraine. He wants NATO, Ukraine to be neutral. We promised him that for a we long time. We promised him in 92 and again, mm -hmm. you know, Gorbachev in 92 and again and again. Yep. And they told us from the start, if you go into Ukraine, don't go to any of these countries. We went into 14 countries, moved NATO a thousand miles to the east. But they said from the outset, NATO is a red line. We've been invaded through NATO three mm -hmm. times. The last time we were invaded, they killed one out of every seven Russians. And we're not going to allow anybody to control NATO and then put Aegis Tomahawk missiles four minutes from Moscow. Correct. I take, we could decapitate the entire Russian leadership in four minutes. The Russian Cuban, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in, in reverse. Exactly, and and of course the Russians don't want that. And you, we, we are, my uncle always said, if you want peace, you better understand your the, opponent. You better, better put yourself in the shoes yeah. of your opponent. Nobody's doing that. Nobody in our government will Why? talk to Putin. Why are we this dumb, or do we have? <laughs> Everything I've never seen an administration make this many errors that all fall 
out of the interest of the United States. I mean, yeah. it's a col- it, it well, is a cluster of bad policies. Here's what I would say, because I don't I never put myself in other people's heads. I don't, okay. you know, to yeah. answer why is he doing it? I, I'll never do that unless I can tell you. I can tell you the incentives. One is at every time we move NATO into a new country, that country is under a contractual obligation to conform its weapons purchases to mm-hmm. NATO specifications. That means billions of dollars. Raytheon, General Dynamics, mm-hmm. um, uh, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, mm-hmm. and Lockheed. And those companies, which are all owned by BlackRock, control both the Republican and Democratic Party. And, you know, that's part of the this whole uh, engine that mm-hmm. keeps us in a constant state of war. Mm-hmm. So they want to go into NATO. And, you know, and then you have a president, President Biden, who always has been... Uh, it's like the big, the only foreign policy tool that he has is military. It's like the guy, Carpenter, who has a hammer. And it's the only tool he's got. And Lindsey so Graham. Every, everything looks like a nail to him. Yeah. And they, and they, you know, the they all, it's a go-to. And, you know, Biden was the first guy into Iraq. You know, my uncle was against the Iraq war. A lot of other people were, but Biden was the guy who was leading the charge for Iraq, which was the worst foreign policy blunder in the history of our republic. We drove Iraq, Iraq today, we spent $4 trillion there. It, we killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We created ISIS. We left, it, it's, a, it's an incoherent battle mm-hmm. between Shia and Sunni death squads. It, we we um, we pushed it into a proxy position with Iran. So now you know it was our bulwark against Iran. Mm-hmm. The reason that Gaza happened is because of Iraq. Mm-hmm. We destroyed Iraq as a bulwark against Iran. So now Iran is you know, flexing its muscles all over mm-hmm. the region. It owns Iraq. It owns Hamas. It owns Hezbollah. It owns the Houthis. And it's you know it's expanding. It's in, it's an expansion mode. Um, we drove four million refugees up into Europe and destabilized every democracy in Europe for the next probably three generations. Mm-hmm. We created Brexit. Brexit is a result, direct result, like linear, from the Iraq War, and we created BRICS, mm-hmm. which is the end of the you know dollar as mm-hmm. a global reserve currency because everybody's so angry at us so, about it. so it was crazy. And but but if you ask. What would happen if you asked Joe Biden today? Was that a colossal error? I don't think he'd say so. No. I think he thinks, oh, we got rid of Saddam Hussein. So I feel as though we're right now fighting Democrats, Republicans. And I don't think it's Democrats and Republicans. I think that's a stage show. I think it is the elites and the people. Brexit is not because they're wild conspiracy theorists or anything else. It's. They, they're proud of their nation in a healthy way, and they want to make their own rules. Here in the United States, over in France, the same thing with the, the French, uh, or not the French, but the uh, uh, Norwegians coming out with their tractors. Look, this is bad for us farmers. Why are we playing this international game? Do you agree with any of that? Yeah, I, I think it's a... It's a- populist and like a class war like yeah. you say but not and, in a neg- not in a well here's the thing about populism populism is easily hijacked by demagogues yes but it it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of you know dark yes it doesn't have to be fascism or nazism yes populism you know it was the populist movement in our country in 1903 that got rid of the Gilded Age. And, and you know, we got the 40-hour work week. We yes. had the child labor. We, we got women the vote. We got, you know, we got the Sherman Antitrust Act passed. And we, we made corporations to pay taxes for the first time. And we passed a law that made it illegal to um, for corporations to donate to federal political candidates. That came out of the populist movement and the country and the progressive movement. So it was an idealistic impulse. 
and but it's often hijacked. And I, you know, I'll give you this example that my father ran a populist campaign in 1968. It all the elites against him. He had the big city mayors against him. He had the un labor unions all against him, except for the UAW and then Cesar Chavez Union. All the other ones who had been with him in 1960 were now against him. The, the liberal newspapers were all against him. The New York Times hated him. The Village Voice, all of them. The liberal democratic clubs were all against him. On the college campuses, um, he was, you know, McCarthy, my father always said, McCarthy had the A students and he had the B and C students. <laughs> and, um, but um, he, had, he, he had, you know, everybody, all the, the power centers were against him, but he, he had this, you know, the last day yeah. of his life. He won the most rural state in our country, South Dakota, and the most urban state, California. And when, you know, when I took that train ride, taking his body, I was with him when he died in Los Angeles. Jeez. And took that train ride from New York City to um, uh, to Washington D.C. to take his body down. There were two million people on the train tracks, and they were every color. Mm. It was the entire cross section of the American people. Mm. There were people in military uniform, Boy Scouts, hippies, or black people, white people, priests, rabbis, people carrying American flags, signing uh, you know signs saying "Goodbye, Bobby," "Pray for his Bobby." And it was the, you know, it was all of America. Four years later, a lot of the white people who had stood on that train track between, you know, uh, Newark and, uh, and Baltimore and Delaware, and who had strongly supported my father in 68, vote, they changed their vote overwhelmingly, not to George McGovern in 72, but to George Wallace who was antithetical to everything my father, mm. but he was now the standard bearer for the populist movement. But it was a dark kind of populism. Right, so right, I right. think all of the, you know, we're seeing a revolution in this country that's gonna happen. You can't have a situation, 57% of the people in this country can't put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. 54% of the people in this country are not making enough money to pay for basic human needs but, but, uh, but uh, and there's going to be a revolution and is it going to be captured by you know the dark regressive forces or are we going to keep are we going to be able to keep it for you know as an expression of idealism so but i think that the problem that we have is the sides are all mixed up i don't know who's who anymore <laughs> uh and uh and you have the federal government colluding with gigantic business i'm a conservative i used to i used to be one of the dummies that used to say apple's not going to do anything google can that oh oh yeah oh yeah they can <laughs> the liberals used to be the ones who would be telling me that now i'm like i'm on your side yeah, and they're they're like they're gone well, they're the gone liberals are now for censorship which is right. astonishing to me the yes. liberals are pro war which is astonishing to me the liberals are anti israel you no, know, they think they're on the the side not of the Palestinians. Well, I'm on the side of the Palestinians, but I'm not on the they're side on of Hamas. The, yes, and I'm not on the side of Iran. <laughs> no, you know, I, no. Um, you know I, I, that what's happened to the Liberal Party? The, the Liberal parties were um, were skeptical of corporate control of Power. our government, and now it's like you know the pharmaceutical companies are like you know they're like the angels of heaven for them where do you stand on the wef the world economic forum it's, it, it is like you know we shouldn't be paying any attention it's a it's a billionaire's boys club as arranging the world to shift wealth upward and, right. to, and to clamp down totalitarian controls on everybody else and right. now they got the capacity to do it they got all these countries running around doing what they tell them to do it's astonishing to me that, you know, th these people go to Davos in their private jets. Yes. And they're able to tell these world leaders, you know, how to how to govern us in ways that eradicate our, our constitutional and civil rights and 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 constantly shifting. Well, I mean, COVID during COVID. You know, and I know you're a, a, a President Trump fan, but President Trump got rolled oh. by his bureaucrats. Oh, I agree. And, and he locked, he came in saying, I'm a businessman. I'm going to run this place like a business. Right. And he gave the keys to all of our 
shops and stores oh, and businesses that Tony Fauci and shut down 3.3 so, 3 million businesses. Let, let's and, talk. Let's talk about this because I, I. But we shifted four trillion dollars of I wealth know. upward. We closed all the little guys. Yeah. And Home Depot Amazon was open, Rich but and Google, yeah, and, and they're all colluding with yeah. each other to censor the people who were like me who were complaining about it. Correct. So um, <laughs> there's, I agree with you on that, and I give everybody the benefit of the doubt for a few weeks because we didn't know necessarily what was coming. So I'll, good intention, bad intention, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But there comes a point to where you're like, oh, wait, wait. Wait, you're shutting down the entire economy. And the I New mean, York I'll Times what, the, New York Times you. wrote about me and saying when I said, you know, there are people my age, we'll go into work, let's keep the thing running so our kids aren't put behind. They said I was trying to kill, yeah. you know, old people. It, right. It's ridiculous. And, you know, I and I'll tell you something about that, but the only kind of well known person who would talk to me come on my podcast early in COVID was Kelly Slater, who's the you know, world greatest surfer in the world right mm -hmm. now, arguably. And Kelly saw what they were doing. He said, look, there's people in, in Malibu, people out surfing in the water, okay? And the sheriff is going and giving them thousand dollar tickets on the beach and telling them not to come back, but go home. And by that time, we already knew that COVID only spread indoors. The way to stop it was to stay in the sunlight and get healthy. Mm -hmm. They were putting in Venice, you know, near where I live in California, they they went to the skateboard parks, mm -hmm. the half pipes, and they threw sand on them so the kids couldn't exercise because couldn't be outside. They they went to the black neighborhoods like Compton or here Harlem, Bed Stuy, and they shut down the basketball courts. And if they couldn't lock them down, they they took the the hoops out. Yeah. So you're locking all these kids in. The only indicia of poverty that actually, you know, improved during COVID was there were fewer reports on child abuse. And why is that? Because most reports on child abuse happen in the schools and we closed down the schools. And we locked all those kids in the apartment with their abusers with no meals because they're getting their one hot meal a day from the right. schools. And you know, the the what we did to our kids' development is just criminal. Oh, it There's is. Criminal. About half of the kids now need, are going to need remedial education all the way through so, high school. We just destroyed this generation. And CDCs, um, they, they, you know, there's a report that came out from Brown University that said there's a 22 IQ point loss mm -hmm. among toddlers. 22 IQ points, mm -hmm. and CDC's response to that is that a year ago, they rewrote the child milestones. So it used to be that a child would have to walk, you know, that you were normal if you walked to 12 months, they changed that to 18 months. That you would have- Just lower the bar. You had, yeah, you, you would have 50 words by 18 months, now they say a year and a half, and so on. So they, you know, they're trying to normalize what they did to our children. And it's so, the whole thing is so criminal and so corrupt. So there's a couple of things, and I'd like to know specifically what you would do. First of all, you, Donald Trump has said that if if he wins, he'd like to make you uh, put you over CDC or FDA, um, and I'd like to talk to you about that. But I, I I also want to hear from you. What do you do to restore the trust if there is, God forbid, Ebola? You know, starts you know circling the world. Who's going to believe it? Who, who's going to listen to the expert doctors? Because the good doctors were all silenced. They all lost their yeah. license. It's just the doctors that are left that, you know, played the game. How do we restore I mean, the, med the, the trust? The medical profession disgraced itself. Disgraced. And, uh, and the, you know, the thousands of doctors who were trying to tell the truth were punished. They were delicensed. They were gaslighted. They were vilified and demonized and silenced. And it was, uh, you know, it was really criminal. I mean, the way, and by the way, we, you know, because of what we now know because of the Wuhan lab, et cetera, they're, they're messing with Ebola and they're messing with 
with, you know, Chichamanga and all of these, you know, really horrific diseases, not with, you know, 0.01 infection mortality rate, but with 50%, 20%, 10%. And, you know, and they're making bad, they're making these diseases. And of course, some of them escape every year. So, you know, that, that needs to be stopped. We need to, we need to restore the Bioweapons Convention of 1973 that Richard Nixon signed, and, and he he said, and he closed down Fort Detrick and said, we're not making bioweapons anymore. And after 2001, the Patriot Act passed a week after 9-11. 9-11 happens. One week later, there is an anthrax attack on our government. And at that point, Patrick Leahy and... Um, and uh, a couple of other senators um, were fighting the Patriot Act and saying, you can't do this. This is a, an attack on American constitutional democracy. And those senators, the ones who were fighting the Patriot Act, are the ones who all got the anthrax. And so they were silenced. The Congress was mm. shut down and they passed the Patriot Act. Well, the Patriot Act had a provision in it that, that says... We're not getting rid of the Geneva Convention on bioweapons. We're not getting rid of the 1973 Bioweapons Convention. Uh, we have a new rule that says that any federal officer or, a, or employee who violates those treaties cannot be prosecuted. And that relaunched the bioweapons arms race. And the Pentagon didn't want to do it at first. As it, you know, violating Geneva's hanging offense. So they started redirecting all that money to Anthony Fauci to do bioweapons uh, research. So why is he in jail? Well, he's not in jail because uh, because Joe Biden is president and because, you know, unfortunately, Donald Trump colluded with him or was, you know, run over by him. Right. Donald Trump knew what was wrong he knew not to shut down our businesses yes. and he knew about you know the uh, he knew about lockdowns he knew about ivermectin hydroxychloroquine and yet and he said it he tried to speak up but his own bureaucrats told him to shut up and he unfortunately did what he was told and that's you know why i think that he uh, he doesn't deserve another chance and you may defend him on that but i don't defend him on the yeah. on the on the uh, vaccine or any of it. I think yeah. I think you could make the case early on. Everybody was trying. I, I try to believe, <laughs> except for Fauci, I try to believe that everybody had good intent doing what they thought was right. And then it just started dogpiling. And then it became, I don't even know, communist China. It, it just, it became a country that I didn't recognize. Yep. And no one yep. was willing to stop it. I want to talk to you about having access to medication in uh, in tough times. Um, and that tough time could just be you're on vacation. You're up in the mountains. Somebody starts to get sick. Do you have antibiotics? You don't have to go down off the mountain to get to a doctor. Um, uh, it also could be uh, the latest is bird flu. Uh, but Tamiflu is supposed to handle that. Do you have Tamiflu? Would you like to have some Tamiflu? I don't know if Jace has, you know, the license to carry Tamiflu yet. I'm, I'm sure they're working on it if they don't. But they carry and are carrying more and more every day of the things that you might need in an emergency or in an emergency, just the regular everyday medications that you that you need to live, have a year's supply worth there at your home. Now, they can start with the emergency kit, five essential antibiotics that treat most common and deadly bacterial infections, and they are working to expand their medications. They have ivermectin as an option uh, for the Jace case. Just in case, the Jace case. I recommend highly that you go there now, get some for your own family, make sure your family is taken care of. You can even give a gift certificate to uh, friends or to your family members that no longer live in the house so they can do it as well. JaceMedical.com. Use the promo code Beck at checkout and you'll save. It's J-A-S-E Medical.com. So I want to I want to be real honest with you. I both like you want to like you love some of the stuff you say and also 
I'm a little terrified by you um, because I don't know who you are yet. I don't know if you've changed or or what, but you're saying a lot of things that I think you deeply believe the the vaccine, the covid stuff, all of that. I, I know you believe that stuff. But then there are things like, for instance, the First Amendment, you talk about people going after people and shutting them down. But I don't know if you remember this, but you said, and so I'm going to tell you that the next time you see John Stossel or Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh, uh, these flat earthers, I believe the earth is round, these corporate toadies lying to you, lying to the American public, telling you that global warming doesn't exist, which I never said, I, I believe in global warming. I just don't believe in the answers that we've come up with so far. I'm telling you that global warming doesn't exist. Send an email to their advertisers. Tell them that you're not going to buy their products anymore. This is treason, and we need to start treating them now as traitors. You're smart enough to know what that means constitutionally. That's execution. Um, I've well, uh, let me say this. I wouldn't say that today. And part of it is uh, part of the reason I wouldn't say that is because um, I watched our country run over not only the First Amendment, but all three arms of the First Amendment, the freedom yes. of worship. We close a million churches Correct. for a year. I, who could have imagined that would not ever me. happen? No. Mm-mm. You know what? ever happen in this country right. with no due process, no just compensation, no uh, scientific citation, no public hearings, none of the safeguards right. of democracy. We then roll over rights to freedom of assembly and association by, you know, with, with this weird science-free, uh, you know, social you distancing. Can, you, you can be at a BLM riot, but you can't protest yeah. COVID. Or you can get on a, you have to wear a mask on a plane, but except when you're eating your meal. You know, I I mean, it was like a kabuki comedy. Correct. And then they shut down the Fifth Amendment, right? You know, they shut down 3.3 million businesses, no due process, no just compensation. They got rid of the Seventh Amendment, which is a right to jury trial. They said Mm -hmm. if a vaccine company or any other, uh, any other entity um, that was responding to COVID countermeasures Cancel. injures you no matter how negligent they are, no matter how malicious they are, uh, no matter how much they lie, no matter how grievous your injuries, you can't sue them. And, you know, the Seventh Amendment says no American shall be denied a, a, a right to a trial Correct. before a jury of his peers in case of controversies exceeding $25. There's no pandemic exception. Mm-hmm. And, There's uh, no exception, really, on any of the amendments. None of them. <laughs> and, you know, and, and they were written for hard times. They weren't written for easy times. The First Amendment was not written for the speech, we're speech okay. that we all want to hear. Yeah. It was for the speech nobody wants to hear. That's embarrassing. That's appalling. That's, right. you know, ideas that are horrible ideas. But that's what it was written to protect. And, you know, during the, during the Civil War, when our country was really this far from falling apart and then we you know killed 659,000 Americans the equivalent of 7.2 million today confederates were sending agents provocateurs to the northern cities to drum up draft riots right and um and those were really destroying northern morale and destroying our capacity to you know to to fight the war and so Abraham Lincoln suspended. They knew who the people were as soon as they came in the city. Right. And Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and started arresting them. And Judge Taney, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said you can't do it. Even if the life of the nation is, is forfeit, you can't do it because the Constitution is more important than anything. Right. So, you know, it was much worse than, it, than anything that happened in COVID, which was a bad flu. Yeah. If we had treated yeah. it like a bad flu, We'd it would be have fine. been a bad flu. Mm-hmm. But we treated it like an emergency and told all these people, you know. So, yeah, my whole, I would never say anything like that today because my thinking on it has evolved. And I can see how dangerous statements like that are um, because, uh, you know, the government actually is doing some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, I accept people changing. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I, uh, 
I, I wondered because there are the WEF, the, the, the part of the Green New Deal is to shut everybody up from talking. And I, I don't I really don't care if we want to change our country, then let's be honest about it and say, this is what we want to do. <laughs> These are the things. And then let's vote on it. And if that side wins, that side wins. At least it was fair and we were open about it and we all know what we're getting into. But we are in this place now of shouting people down and saying, you don't have a right to say this. You don't have a right to talk. That's a danger to democracy. Quite honestly, I think almost everything that our government is doing is a danger to democracy right now. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. Uh, that it's, uh, and for starters, it just lies about everything. Yes. <laughs> and and you, there's, and there's no, no transparency and there's no effort. I mean, you know, you're a senator and you ask for, you know, Correct. Um, information on the Wuhan lab and you get 150 pages fully redacted. There's no oversight. What? So, uh, you know, and and you you talk to these senators and congressmen who are getting, who are just not allowed. Right. To see what's happening inside of the U.S. government agencies. And, you know, what does this have to do with democracy? And everybody's treating it. It's like it's normal. So what is it? I mean, you, you watch Congress and Congress just gave their power away to the to the administrative state years ago. I don't think any of them want to pass. And some of them do. Some of them are really good guys. But a lot of them don't want to. They don't want to be held responsible for anything. We just did an episode where we showed how many of them are performing well over the S&P 500, you know, with increases of 232 percent year over year. What do you mean? They, you mean congressmen's? Yeah, investments, investments, their portfolios. Okay. Yeah, yeah, their portfolios where well, they have. I saw my kids showed me a a website where you can. Um, it's like a fund where you can bet on Nancy yes. Pelosi's bets. Right, right. Because her, you know, because she's exceeding that. Yeah, she she's consistently. She, I think, was eighty nine or ninety two percent over the S and P yeah. five hundred. I mean, it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen unless yeah. you're insider trading. So everybody seems to be getting rich. The American people are getting poorer. We have out of control spending, which honestly, you know, at least could we get a nice car for everybody? I mean, I feel like we spend all this money and we've got nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it. We have worse than nothing. We have a $34 trillion debt. Yes. We're now, the, the cost of servicing that debt every year is more than our military budget. Yeah. And within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar collected in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt. Within 10 years, 100% of the money we collected in taxes is going to be needed for the debt. And so how is nobody so how do you talking? St- so and how do you stop we, it? Well, that's the thing is, I, I'm going to stop that. President Trump's not going to stop it. He ran up the biggest debt of any president in history. He ran up after saying, you know, I'm going to address the debt. He ran up an $8 trillion debt personally, which is more than all the presidents before him combined since George Washington for 283 years. And then, and Biden is now on the route to matching that. And it's insane. And there, it's unsustainable. It's going to destroy our country. and Destroy our dollar. Everything. The, the, the only way... You know, we need to cut, we need to do huge cuts to our defense budget. That's the big, you know, and then we need to cut our, our um, health costs. The only way to stop our health costs is by ending the chronic disease epidemic, which we can do very quickly. But, you know, right now we have agencies that are all tied in with the food processors, the pharmaceutical companies that are driving this uh, you know, the, the chronic disease epidemic. So chronic, I, when, my, when my uncle was president, the the annual budget, the, the, the cost of health care was about 4 to 6% of our GDP. Today, it's almost 20%. Mm-hmm. And the cost of health care, the cost of treating chronic disease is $4.3 trillion. Oh, so the cost of diabetes alone 
is as large as the, um, which is which is you know mitochondrial dysregulation. The cost of that is larger than our defense budget. When I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of juvenile diabetes in his whole lifetime. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Nobody's talking about this. The cost of autism is now a trillion dollars a year. When, when my generation, I'm 70, you're 60, I'm I didn't 70 know any, years old. I didn't know anybody with autism. No, we knew nobody when we were I didn't a kid. know anybody with peanut allergies. No, my kid, my wife, I had 11 siblings, 70 cousins, nobody with a peanut allergy. Why do five of my seven kids have, have allergies? Mm -hmm. Why does, you know, it, the, the autism rates in my generation today, right now, 2024, one in 10,000 70 year old men have autism. And my kids' generation is one in every 34 kids, one in every 22 boys, according to CDC. Nobody's talking about this. These are bankrupting our country. It's a trillion dollars a year just for autism. All these kids who are disabled. Nobody's talking about why is this happening? But, you have, but you're, we're, we're living in a time where the big corporations, big food, big pharma, everything, big food destroying our local farms, destroying, destroying them. them. I'm, I'm, I'm a rancher. With the government. We, yeah, absolutely the, with the government. There's only four meat packers in this whole country. Why? Why? Because, you know, they, they, the first thing I'm going to do is file antitrust against them because they're all owned by BlackRock, right? And so, and BlackRock, that's the way they want it. So there's, the government has the absolute power to, to and they're squeezing, they're squeezing the ranchers and they're squeezing the consumers and they're making all the money and shifting the money upward. It's completely illegal and they're getting away with it because they have political control. What are your thoughts on ESG? ESG. You know what ESG is? Environmental, social, governance, standards yeah, for the banking. I, you know, I believe in free markets. And I think, you know, we, we, that we should have markets in our energy sector and elsewhere that, that, fund, that, with, that we need to get rid of subsidies. Most environmental pollution is subsidies. In fact, all of it is. It's a way of liquidating the environment for cash and putting it on your profit line. What I will, you know, what my policy is, is get rid of the subsidies and um, including the environmental subsidies. But will you get rid of the um, the the collusion between the governments of the world and the banks with ESG standards saying you have to have certain social uh, practices, environmental practices and governance practices? And the banks refusing to give loans to those companies that say, no, you, you don't have a place to tell me these things. You don't have a place yeah, to tell me you have I, I to be on the board. I don't think that that's a good idea. And by the way, I, you know, listen, I've been working on civil rights issues my whole life. My first case as an environmental lawyer was... Um, was NAACP against the uh, representing NAACP and against the town of Austin for putting a, um, a waste transfer station in, in the oldest uh, black neighborhood in the Hudson Valley. And I've worked on environmental justice issues my whole life. 20% of my, my career has been spent representing American Indians in uh, litigation against polluters and you know big resource companies. I've, uh, I work in all these areas. I've been for 35 years, I've been on the board of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration, which is the oldest and biggest community development corporation in the country, which is, which is the, the purpose of it is to get capital and entrepreneurial expertise into black community, into the, one of the biggest, you know, biggest black community in, in New York and has been very, very successful at doing that. And I think that the, you, you can't eliminate racism by telling people don't be racist. <laughs> you, you, what you do, what you can do is we can make our kids resilient. When I was a kid, I was, you know, it was, my uncle was running for president. He was the first Irish Catholic president. 
And there was a lot of Irish Catholic prejudice at that time and bigotry. Time. And yeah. I was called a mackerel snatcher when I was a kid. I was called a uh, Mick and all of these other, right. you know, right. uh, pejoratives. It never affected me. I would, I somebody would call me those names. And I'd say something's wrong with them. Yeah. And we want to make sure that because I knew I, I had a good education, I had a loving family around me, I had opportunities, and I, and that was not going to get in my way. There were just people who were, you know, yeah. nasty or people, and that's just what life was. Right. Oh, I want to make sure that every black kid in this country has that resilience so that if somebody says something or does something racist to them, that they can stand up for themselves and stand up with confidence. Right. And the way you do that is by making sure our education system works for them. There are, you know, there are charter schools in New York like the Success Academy, which brings kids in by lottery. So, okay, it, it's bringing, choosing kids from the, from the um, right. most impoverished neighborhoods by lottery. And they have a better graduation rate and a better college placement rate than Scarsdale High School, which is the best high school, public high school in the state. But that, so that, we, to do we can that. fix our education system. And again, I think it's ultimately through giving people choice. But it, so are you giving, for school choice? Yeah, I'm for school choice. And I'm for. But I also want to make sure the principals have control over what happens in their schools so that they're held responsible for it. But so they also you have saw the effect of the labor unions because of COVID on their schools. Well, I, right. And I, I, you know, I disagree with what a lot of things that children's or that the, um, that the teachers union did. But I would say this, that the people who've been very, very successful at this have been able to figure out ways to work with the unions. What you need is you need principals who have the power to fire people. And you can negotiate and work with the unions to buy out contracts and to, you know, and to do it in a way that is as least disruptive and as least tension as possible. Uh, but I think we need to have choice. We need to give principals control over their own schools and then hold them responsible. But you can't hold them responsible without giving them control. And then if the school doesn't work, if they're not educating our children, they're gone. Um, Second Amendment, where do you stand on the Second I'm Amendment? not taking anybody's guns. Oh, I, you know, um, you know, there was a time in my life, you know, my father was killed by a gun. My uncle was killed by a gun. Uh, I, you know, I, I know other people whose lives have been, I saw what it did to my family. Mm -hmm. Seeing what it does to other people. But I also understand, I, you know, I've spent um, years of my life in rural areas in this country. And I spent, lived for two years in Alabama. I've lived in South Dakota. I, I grew up in Virginia. And I know that there's a gun culture in this country that, um, that sees that, you know, that is an existential right for them. And that, you know... Um, Do you see it as a right? I mean, it is a right. It's in our bill. Well, it's, I, I believe in the Constitution. Okay. And, it, and it, it's part of the Second Amendment. So, yeah. yeah. I, and I think that we need to work with each other to understand why we're having the gun violence in this country that no other country has so do you believe i mean i think these are kind of separate i mean the law-abiding gun owner they they're not the ones you know going out and shooting usually um it's the ones who aren't either taking care of them correctly in their home or it's you know criminal activity um but well, the, no, but, the, mean, but the idea of, of a gun is not to hunt. It is to protect against an out-of-control government. Yeah. So, you know, I think something happened. Because, you know, when I was a kid, we had uh, gun clubs in our schools. And people would bring their right 22s mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. And they'd leave them in the car. Or they'd bring them in. And, you know, nobody was shooting at people. And something happened. There's never been a time in human history where individuals with guns were walking into crowds of strangers, crowds of children, and mm. starting to butcher them. That's never happened. No. Suddenly that started happening around Columbine. And uh, 
the question is why it's happening. Why is it happening in this country? And, you know, Switzerland has a comparable level of, of gun on all ownership. Correct. Everybody's required to have a gun in their yeah. house. And they, the last mass shooting they had in Switzerland was 21 years ago. The last so mass shooting. Culture is sick. We have, we have mass shootings every 21 hours. So the question is, why is that happening? And, you know, I think that we need NIH is, under its own rules, is not allowed to look for the answer to that question. There's a lot of things NIH won't do. NIH won't look for the, the cause of the autism epidemic. They won't look for the cause of peanut allergies. They won't look at any of these things. Because they're frightened that there's a big, a big shot, a big food processor, big ag, big pharma that is going to have be angry at them with the answer. Mm. So they simply won't do it. And one of the things they have not looked at, they have a rule. Since 1997, they have not been able to look at the cause of gun violence. When Columbine happened, five of the family victims of the family sued, uh, I think, Prozac. And, you know, there, there are SSRIs. I've talked about this. I'm not saying this is the answer. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it's something that we should look at, that SSRIs have black box labels and benzos that say yep. uh, cause, uh, cause, known to cause suicidal and homicidal behavior. Correct. It says that. Right. Okay. And, and we're the only country that has this level 120 million, 240 million doses a year of these. Correct. And all of a sudden, and after Columbine, that's when it started happening. So I'm not saying there's other things that could be. Yes, yes, yes. I understand. It could be video games. Mm -hmm. It could be social media. There's a lot. It could be a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors, but we should know what it is because one thing we do do know, it, it, it has nothing to do with the number of guns, because there hasn't been any legislation out there that has diminished or increased Correct. the number of guns during that period. It's been roughly constant. Oh, if you have a scientific mind, which I do, I'm looking for the variables that change during that period. Right. And that's what the CDC ought to be doing. And now, you know, because I'm having this conversation with you, I'm going to get ridiculed. I'm going to, be, you know, that Kennedy said that SSRIs are calling it, which I've never said. But, no, it is. But, 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 it's but reasonable to put that, that should, on should, the should table. Makes sense to everybody yes. in the world, which is, let's figure out why that's happening, and and not you know, and and then and then deal with it, and let's make sure we know what the culprit is. My only thought on that is, I don't trust. Everything's been so politicized that I don't trust any of. That's why you need to vote for me, Glenn. Because, <laughs> because uh, I, I know I know how to dismantle mm. corporate capture in these agencies. Let me ask you two. Let me ask you two quick questions. One, historically, person who has run uh, as the third party, I think Ross Perot did the best in history. He had nineteen percent. Ran as Perot, a, Teddy Roosevelt did better than him. But he still he's the reason we had Woodrow Wilson. Um, well, yeah, but that's, that, is, that, is, that, is, that has nothing to do with the point. <laughs> All right. So how so do you believe you can win? Yeah, I, I believe I can win. I'm already beating both President Trump and President Biden among all Americans under 35. I'm beating them in the battleground states under among all people under the six battleground states under 45. Hmm. I'm beating them among independent voters. And independents are now the biggest political demographic. So this is the first election in United States history in which independent, self-identified independents are represent more people than either Democrats or Republicans. If forty-three percent of Americans self-identify as independents versus twenty-seven percent for Democrats, twenty-seven percent for Republicans. My favorability ratings are 10 points ahead of President Trump or President Biden. Net favorability is yes. 20 points. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, and you know, uh, we have a, we're living at a time when we have two presidents who are running, former presidents, who each, if they were the only one running, 
would be the least popular mm -hmm. person to run for a major mm -hmm. party in mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. they, they are the two worst. And 80%, 70 to 80% of Americans say they don't want that contest again. So I think if there was a time that an independent could run um, and could run successfully, it would be now. You know, if we have debates, um, I think that would be a very, very big uh, turning point. But the all, I'll tell you what, the only group that I don't, that is a large group, we're in a three-way tie with Hispanic voters, and i am got momentum with me. The only group where I don't do well is with baby boomers. And I should do great with baby boomers because they all remember Camelot and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the Kennedy years. And I was a big hero to baby boomers, uh, you know, and I was the, mm -hmm. known only as the environmental champion. <clears throat> but they watch baby boomers get their news from television, from MSNBC yeah, yeah. and from CNN and from the New York Times and the Washington Post. And if you're living in that and ecosystem. Fox. I yeah. include Fox in that. Well, yeah, but, you know, Fox actually lets me on all the time to mm. do interviews. Okay. And, you know, I, um, and so, but the other, MSNBC doesn't, CNN does not. What does that feel like to go from hero to zero on that side? I mean, you've been a Democrat. Your family is, n they're the lions of the Democratic Party. And all of a sudden that party really doesn't like, the party really doesn't like you and you're even having problems with your own family how how what i mean that's a big sacrifice yeah i i, I um well I, I, let me just say this about my family i have a lot of family members who support me and a lot of, are working on the campaign particularly the younger generation uh, but my campaign's being run by amaryllis kennedy who's you know my my daughter-in-law, my cousin Anthony Shriver, is running Florida for me. So I have, you know, I laugh. it's a big family. And, <laughs> it's a huge you know, family. Um, yeah. But I also, there's a lot of family who are against me as well mm -hmm. and are horrified. I have five members of my family who are working for the Biden administration. And, you know, B President Biden, long-term friend of my family, yep. has a bust of my father behind him at the Oval mm -hmm. Office. He, you know, he... He talks about how my father inspired him to get into politics. So I understand why they're, you know, upset. Um, but, you know, I come from a family also that we, you know, we were raised debating each other. Well, my father would instigate debates every night the same way that his father did. And we were expected to debate with passion and commitment and information without hating each other. So I love my family. I feel loved by them. They differ with me on that. They're going to fight like hell to make sure I don't succeed. Would I like it if they were all on my side? Yes. yes. But, you know, does it um, does it ruin my day? No, I'm not at all. And, you know, I feel like this, Glenn, that every person who I've admired throughout my entire life, the people who I really, you know, the historical figures, mm -hmm. All of them went through periods where they had to, you know, march mm -hmm. through the dark night of the soul when mm -hmm. they felt alone, on, and mm -hmm. the, where people betrayed them, people um, that they, you know, um, that they felt uh, betrayed and alone during periods. And but that was part of their journey, and that you have to embrace that. And uh, you know, I do, and I have my wife, who is incredible, who supports me. My kids absolutely support me and are proud of what I'm doing. And they're bright, intelligent, and you know, wonderful um, counselors to me. And uh, you know, I, it's part of the adventure of life, right? That you're, you know, to to have all of your friends basically drop you at once, and you know, over an issue of of principle. And uh, and so, you know, I just feel like this is, you know, my lot. And that I have to, I have to embrace it. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't ever sink into self pity or vituperation or mm -hmm. you know anger at, at people. I just, it's their choice. I have to walk my path, and I have to do it with joy and with you know, um, magnanimity and, and and forgiveness and uh, and you know. So I, I it, to me, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> It's a pleasure to meet you and you talk too, to you. You too, Glenn. Thank you.